All right, good morning, everyone. We are gonna go ahead and call the meeting to order at 1031. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. The meeting is being recorded. Uh, anything shared in the meeting uh, via voice, video, or chat will be part of the recording. These are published on the ADHS uh, website. So just a reminder to uh, please keep yourself on mute and your cameras off if you do not want that recorded. If you are joining by telephone, you may need to hit star six to unmute yourself. And uh, Shelly, I will go ahead and have you do roll call. All right, Alberto Gutierrez. Brian Smith. Present. Chris Salvino. Here. Dale Woolridge. Dan Spate. I'm here. And um, can you hear me, Shelley? Yes, sir. Uh, Deborah Grombe. Present. Franco Castro Marin. Gail Bradley. Present. Garth Gamer. Glenn Casperson. Good morning, present. Thank you. Heather Miller. Howard Reed. Heather Miller's present. Uh, Sorry. Got you, Heather. Uh, Howard Reed is present. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Eve, Eve Godstenker. He's having microphone issues. He'll be in the chat. James Hayden. Present. Michelle Preston. Mike Duran. Neil Williamson. Present. Rebecca Harrow. Rod Reed. Present. Roy Ryle. Present. Sarah Parati. Shari Brand. Sharon McDonough. Sharon McDonough is present. Thank you. Stevie Merrill. Todd Harmio. Present. Vince Martino. Present. Vivian Gillard. Present. Shelly, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I count 18, we have quorum. Shelly, this is Garth Gamer, present. Oh, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Shelly. Uh, just a few housekeeping items under uh, my report section. The attendance report is attached in your packet. Uh, if there is a reminder in the bylaws, there is an attendance requirement. If you are unable to meet the requirement, Shelly will reach out to you uh, to ensure that you would still like to participate in this committee. Uh, we do have four current vacancies. Uh, there are three spots for public members, as well as one for hospital administrator for county population greater than 500,000. Uh, this uh, is appointed by the governor's office, so you can go to the governor's website. It's bc.azgovernor.gov if you would like to apply for any of those positions. Uh, next on uh, the agenda is just a brief reminder about the naloxone leave behind. Uh, just if you would like, uh, there is on the agenda a hyperlink to our section on the website uh, that is really specific to the naloxone leave behind program. Uh, we are really trying to uh, circulate this as frequently as possible. So I know you've heard me bring this to this group multiple times, uh, but we really want to get the messaging out there. Uh, there is the opportunity for uh, EMS to participate in naloxone leave behind. Uh, program. We try to make this as simple as possible. There is a standing order, an educational packet, uh, training PowerPoint that be, can be customized to your jurisdiction, along with a link to where you can get free naloxone off with this program as well. So again, we'll just keep circulating this information. 
uh, to make sure that we do get this out there uh, to the community as much as possible. Uh, next is recognizing uh, Trauma Awareness and EMS uh, Week. So this month, uh, month of May, is Trauma Awareness Month. Uh, Shelly, if you can go ahead and open that, along with uh, this week is EMS Week. So you can see displayed here uh, is a nice infographic that was developed just recognizing uh, that May is Trauma Awareness Month. And then also wanted to make sure we recognize this week that this is uh, EMS Week uh, and this nice infographic was put together as well. Uh, next two items uh, for display are the uh, EMS Annual Snapshot and Trauma System Snapshots. These are relatively new for um, our data set. Uh, these were put together by Julia Vinton uh, last year for the first time, and then we're put together again now with the 2020 data. Uh, these are a really nice one-page summary of our EMS system. Uh, really paints a great picture of, kind of what our uh, EMS system looks like across the state along with our trauma system. Uh, you can see here for the 2020 year, we had just over a million records in our AZ Peers uh, data set. And for uh, the actual date, uh, charts that were included in the analysis was just under, uh, under 890,000. 166 EMS agencies submit data across the state. Uh, you can see there are kind of the uh, average number of incidents per uh, day. Uh, the number of active certifications, we have just under 20,000 certifications uh, in Arizona. Uh, and about 2,500 new uh, EMCT certifications in 2020. If you can scroll down just a little bit there, you can see prevalence of primary and secondary impressions of categories of, in uh, of interest, as well as mortality uh, by primary and secondary impression category as well. Any questions about the uh, EMS snapshot? All right, next we'll go to the trauma snapshot. All right, you can see here uh, a nice depiction of the trauma centers across Arizona. We have a total of 47 trauma centers. Uh, you can see the breakdown by level ones as well as uh, level three and four and level one pediatric trauma centers. If you scroll down just a little bit further, you see the top six mechanism of injury. I think no surprise to anyone that falls are uh, the number one mechanism followed by motor vehicle crashes. You can see that approximately 10% of those are pediatric uh, for trauma cases. Uh, the question did come up in staff this morning, what was the age cutoff for this report? Uh, for this, for pediatric patients, it is zero to 17. And then you can see the median injury to emergency department arrival time, obviously different for urban versus rural setting, uh, 48 minutes versus 79 minutes. And then if you scroll down just a little bit further at the bottom, we have our risk and protective factors kind of highlighted them as well. So really nice snapshots. They are hyperlinks to this from the agendas, and these are also available for review on our website. Any questions on either of those? Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, next, just a follow-up item at our last meeting, we had mentioned that Nesenso uh, was getting ready to publish uh, the final model uh, EMS clinical guideline update, the version three update. Those were finally published in March of 2022. Uh, PMD has started the process of looking to update the state uh, triage tra uh, tr treatment and transport guidelines. Uh, based on the updates from the uh, Nesenso guidelines as well. So that process has started. I uh, also just wanted to make sure everyone had the hyperlinks to the final version, and that is in your agenda as well. Uh, one of the reasons for the delay was uh, the hope to include uh, in the model EMS guidelines nationally, uh, the ACS updated field triage guidelines mm -hmm. were published by ACS. Uh, next up, I had a special request from Jim Hayden, although it looks like he may have just, just left. Jim, are you still on the meeting? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm, I'm in person, so I left the actual digital meeting, uh, Dr. Okay. Bradley. Okay, go ahead. I think you had a quick announcement you wanted to make. Yeah, I, I did. Just to, just to take a minute of, of personal uh, privilege, uh, I have some very exciting uh, news uh, to share. And we have a special guest that also joined us um, in person uh, today uh, with that uh, um, exciting uh, news. So as you're all aware, uh, the nonprofit organization that we started at EMS Health um, to be able to help uh, reduce 
um, suicide and suicide prevention of, of emergency medical um, services and fire services as a uh, as a whole. Um, within, within the last uh, nine months or so, uh, we've embarked upon an additional endeavor, um, and, it's, and it's a pledge. Um, this pledge um, is um, called Stop Our Stigma. So stopourstigma.org is a domain that uh, the EMS Help um, has uh, uh, acquired. The domain is up and running. Um, that domain, um, you uh, join, uh, you commit to the pledge that's there. And part of the pledge um, is that anybody that's um, in um, a leadership position or in the healthcare space. So we made the decision just in our last board meeting that we're going to expand this to any healthcare worker that has patient care contacts. I think we've come to the conclusion um, that the stigma associated with suicide um, and our profession goes just goes beyond EMS and fire, and it really touches anybody in the world of the deliver, delivery of healthcare uh, to patient care. So with the um, Stop Our Stigma uh, campaign and the pledge, the people that take the pledge, um, we've committed to provide training um, statewide, no charge to any agency um, on Train the Trainer program, which will be led by Chief Brewster from the uh, Peoria Fire Medical um, and also our Chandler Fire Chief, uh, Chief Tom Wiggins, have agreed uh, to take the lead on uh, that uh, uh, information going out um, to um, the agencies and organizations across the state that are interested in the Train the Trainer program um, for uh, resiliency um, as a whole. So part of that program is also um, requires an expense. Um, and that expense that uh, we've been working very diligently uh, to be able to bring in additional funds to be able to do that. Um, I literally found out yesterday um, that uh, we were accepted uh, and got a grant um, and a donation to EMS Help to support um, Stop Our st Stigma. Um, and I've invited the uh, president um, of PNC Bank uh, for the st entire state of Arizona um, here today to introduce uh, her, her, her name is Kathleen Walker. And Kathleen Walker brought a check in and is going to present that and talk a little bit, maybe just a tad about um, the process that she went through uh, in, in vetting um, the services and what we're going to be providing. So I'm completely elated to uh, introduce uh, Kathleen Walker. Kathleen? Thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, my name is Kathleen Walker. I'm the regional president for Phoenix in Northern Arizona, not all of Arizona, but I have a colleague that touches Tucson in Southern Arizona. But I'm really pleased and honored to be here to present this check to you, Jim, for EMS Health for $25,000 to support all that work that you're talking about. I was not aware of all this until I had met Jim. He, he filled me in of what the work that Stop Our Sigma and EMS Health does. I've spoken to Chief Brewster. It's been an amazing journey for us going through that process. Uh, to his point, for us to provide these kind of funds, we need to get local approval. One of the people on my team, when I brought this to them, he, he confirmed, he said they do amazing work through that organization. So that's fabulous. But then it goes back through, you know, a, a full vetting. And Jim is aware of all that vetting we've been doing on, on the organization. But we're really pleased to help support these efforts. They're critically needed. And particularly in the last few years, we've just seen incredible direct stress on these personnel. So it's real to do it. So thank you for being a great partner. Thank you very much for the check. And Gail, thank you for the personal privilege. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Much. Absolutely. Thank you. That is a wonderful donation and certainly a great cause. We recognize that uh, there are a lot of downstream effects uh, that we have seen over the last couple of years. And uh, anything that we can do to support the mental health of our healthcare providers and EMS uh, providers is definitely helpful. So thank you again. Uh, before I turn it over uh, to Chief Garcia of the Bureau Report, uh, I just wanted to really recognize uh, Bob Ramsey uh, for his retirement from uh, EMS Council. Um, Bob was really a longstanding member for many, many years of EMS Council, uh, and he did want to share some words uh, with the Council. Uh, so I'll go ahead and read those for him. Uh, it says, I have been honored to serve continuously on the EMS Council for many years. I've been gratefully privileged to be appointed by every governor of the state of Arizona from Honorable Bruce Babbitt to Honorable Doug Ducey. I am humbled by the trust of working alongside dedicated members, staff, medical directors, hospitals, fire departments, statewide and medical administrative advisors that have made Arizona EMS the best in Arizona and the nation and have contributed to enhanced medical practices that change the world. I wish I could thank all of those in the past and all currently that have given so much and continue to give to others. 
uh, their communities and their agencies, what has consistently over decades become the best in EMS, health and wellness, evidence-based practices, medical direction, public policy, data knowledge, and a legal structure of enlightened governance. To all and everyone, I sincerely salute you. The completion of my service in the EMS Council these many years, though heartfelt, is joyfully given. Uh, may God's greatest blessings surround you all in the mighty mission and responsibility you have for the citizens and patients of Arizona, Bob Ramsey. So really just wanted to take a minute and read his uh, words. As I mentioned, uh, Bob has been a very long-standing member uh, of EMS Council, and so we wanted to take a minute to recognize him for his years of service. And I will go ahead and turn it over next to Chief Garcia for the Bureau Report. All right, good morning and happy EMS week. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. Um, we'll go ahead and um, just quickly acknowledge that we continue to do the meetings in a hybrid format. And as of today, I think we have about 20% of our people joining in person and um, about 80% that are joining virtually. So since that seems to be the preferred option and we keep getting good participation, I think we will keep with this hybrid format, but certainly for future meetings, we're gonna be looking at some nice meeting space with, with good audio and we'll keep improving the hybrid format for folks that would like to join in person. It's great to see your faces in the room, by the way. Um, so some quick legislative and rule updates for this group today. The Department of Health Services is not sponsoring any legislation related to EMS this session, but we are keeping an eye on a handful of bills that are making their way through the process right now. Um, there is a CON bill that is, I believe, on its way back to the House right now, um, and a, a few others with potential to impact EMS. And certainly as um, we move through session, we'll continue to provide updates to stakeholders as we receive them. And if there are any questions for the department or the bureau related to pending legislation, please let us know. And you know we are always a resource if there are questions. We're still awaiting our budget for this upcoming year. Um, you know, it's that special time where everything slows down and we are waiting to see what our appropriation looks like. On the rules side, we do have the new air ambulance rules that are going into effect next month on June 5th. We have been meeting with our air ambulance providers to talk about the new changes that will go into effect next month. We'll continue to follow up with a few clarifications on some of the items that are changing, but overall, uh, we're very um, pleased with the participation we've had in the rulemaking process. The air ambulance rules package in particular was over two years in the making, working with stakeholders on that update and so thank you very much for everyone that has participated and we'll keep the communication going with our air providers as we move towards implementation next month. The ground ambulance rulemaking is still in effect. That is the only other um, rule that we have open at this time. We do have updates on the department website for folks that are interested in the progress with the ground ambulance rules. As of right now, we are planning at least one more stakeholder meeting on Article 9 CON rules, but that meeting has not yet been scheduled. Again, I'll just mention we don't have any other rules open, but we continue to look at scope of practice and other things, at least on an annual basis. And I think a little bit later in the meeting, we'll talk a bit about some information we're seeing and hearing from other states that are looking at certification, training, and other things. Uh, we had a meeting recently with NISEMSO. I just want to put out there that they are asking states how they are tracking their workforce and provider data, especially over time, and looking at trends related to workforce and provider needs across states. We'll be following up with our regional councils to talk a little bit about how we might be able to utilize the regional councils over the next year to make sure we're looking at workforce data and other things. Most recently in the last month, we did host a trauma program managers and medical directors work group. It was well attended and pretty well received. Next, we're kicking around the idea of bringing back the base hospital and medical directors workshop. And so we'll, we'll definitely be keeping in touch as we have new staff to introduce to stakeholders. We wanna make sure that we're 
creating those connection points for everybody to get to know our new team members within the Bureau of EMS and Trauma, and that we're also sharing information about those programs. I think that's all I have for now, Dr. Bradley. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Vassal next. Excellent, thank you so much. Thanks, Rachel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, Shelly, one more time. No problem. Okay. So we are continuously monitoring our cardiac arrest and opioid data by month. And as you can see, our for the month of April, there is a slight increase in, in the, uh, for this year for the number of cardiac arrest cases compared to last year. Uh, but the trend is pretty very similar. There's just a very slight increase we see. And in terms of the disposition, the percent that has increased a bit in the month of April. So uh, it was that was increased in the month of March also. And the transport, we are still showing, seeing the same, uh, you know, decline, you know, the decrease in the number, like if you see in the month of March and then month of April as compared to the previous year. Opioid incidents. We, uh, in the month of March, it was 859 cases, and now we are again 765 cases per month. And in terms of disposition, the deaths, we are pretty much similar to compared to the last year, 7%, a year around 6.4% little decrease. So uh, 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 pretty, pretty soon we are developing a new dashboard, which will give you uh, a real-time data on so a few major primary impressions of you know, EMS, like cardiac arrest, stroke, and STREMI, and which would give you a weekly volume, you know, like, and it would be as current as like a last week, what was the volume. So we are working on that, and pretty, pretty soon it will be on our website. Um, that's about it. Any questions? <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Voxel. Uh, next, just wanted to uh, give a brief uh, SHARE program update. Uh, so a few updates regarding the SHARE program. Uh, last summer, we did start a process of trying to get all the hospitals, both cardiac receiving and referral centers, to submit some documentation to really ensure that they were able to still uh, maintain the capabilities uh, to the cardiac receiving or referral center. Uh, for a little bit of background on this program, this program was first spearheaded by Dr. Bobro and really made Arizona a leader in uh, kind of resuscitation uh, mm -hmm. outcomes across the country. Uh, as the program has been in place for a number of years and we had some transition, uh, we recognized that we really wanted to re-engage uh, the system. And so we've reached out to all the hospitals. I should say uh, Julia did a lot of work reaching out to all the hospitals across the state, uh, trying to re-engage everyone in the SHARE program. Uh, we're very happy to say I think one facility uh, has submitted their documentation for the, across the state. Uh, we have had a couple centers that have elected to downgrade from cardiac receiving uh, to cardiac referral center status. Uh, and we recognize that that is an important part of the program if you no longer have the capabilities uh, to maintain the status. So we want to make sure that EMS aware, is aware of that. Uh, so we are very appreciative of all the hospitals that took the time to submit those updates and get that to us. Our goal is to really have that uh, kind of update uh, done every three years, so that way we have a good track of really where programs are. Uh, in addition, in regards to data submission, uh, the hospitals are doing really well this year with their data submission uh, to uh, the U of A uh, regarding uh, their outcomes from cardiac arrest. And we're very hopeful that the 2021 uh, reports will be out much sooner uh, due to the fact that we have gotten the data. I do know that uh, Dr. Spate and Bruce Barnhart are both on the line. I don't know if either of you wanted to mention anything briefly about SHARE. Uh, this is Dan uh, Gale. Thanks. Yeah, no, I just just want to just wanted to say how uh, impressive it is that coming out of the out of the um, 
uh, pandemic, the hospitals have been incredibly responsive with really rare exceptions and are, are really helping. So we expect this year's uh, share report to probably be at least six and maybe even seven months earlier than last month. So the pandemic made it tough for everybody, but we expect to be actually getting the annual report done earlier than we ever have before in our previous 12 years. So uh, thanks for the opportunity for that uh, update, Gail. Thanks, Dan. All right, I will pass it over to Anne for NEMSIS 3.5 update. Anne? Good morning, everybody. Um, I have a few more details than I had last time just because we're getting a little bit closer. So our current estimated acceptance date for V35 for the state level, so not when agencies have to go, but when we hope to be able to accept data from agencies if they want to send it for 3.5, is July or August. It's dependent a bit on vendor readiness and um, some key product features that although not all of them absolutely necessary will just make it a lot easier for people to submit data and use the product. Um, the deadline for agencies to transition to the version 3.5 will be July 1st, 2023. Um, I'm trying to get the information out regarding the upcoming 3.5 transition, but feel free to spread the word. I, I'm worried that there are some agencies that still don't realize that this is going on. Um, hopefully their vendors are letting them know, but feel free to, if they have questions, to have them contact me. Um, we will accept mixed versions of data from agencies during the transition. So in other words, as an agency starts to change over, um, there you can send both the current version, which is 3.4, and the new version 3.5, but just not duplicate records. But they don't have to flip the switch and switch from 4 to 5, like in one day. Um, we plan to start testing with various vendors, um, other EPCR vendors who are interested once they achieve NEMSIS 3.5 uh, compliance certification. Uh, the 3.5 data set and data dictionary are nearing completion for distribution. And uh, next steps, we're going to likely have some beta agencies who are interested in trying it out first. That'll be one of our next steps um, before we go, well, when we go live, but it'll be the first step when we go live. Um, and also we're gonna work with agencies on feedback about some changes to the validation rules that we'll need to change because of the three, five changes. And also um, we're collaborating with some agencies to try to set up a, not a required three, five form template, but kind of an example one that they can go off of. We really didn't have anything like that for three, four. So um, I want to thank the EMS agencies that are working with me on that. And lastly, um, we're also going to start working with our data consumers to hopefully ensure that there's continued data exchange with little or no interruptions. The example are the trauma registry where our linkage occurs, the HIE for those agencies that are participating, and of course, hospitals, um, we need to update the forms with the new data elements so that on those PDFs, they're available for hospitals to view as agencies switch over. So that is it for my update. And I don't know if anyone has any questions now or they're welcome to contact me later. Thank you, Anne. I think uh, def definitely we wanna make sure we get this information out to as many different venues as possible. Uh, we would hate to have a scenario where an agency was not aware that there was this big update and all of a sudden their charts do not uh, go through. So. Thank you for being willing to share that message today. All right, next I will turn it over to Travis. Good afternoon, everybody. Our Bureau is researching and working with grades TMS portal and trauma registry system. As some of you may already know, ESO's trauma one is phased out within the next three to five years. So our Bureau is taking a proactive approach and making plans for this transition now. These significant upgrades will take place towards the end of this year and into 2023. We are confident that these upgrades will provide considerable value to your organization and workflows you execute within our systems. We will continue to keep our stakeholders informed during future meetings and use committees to solicit feedback when we get to that stage. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks. All right, thank you, Travis. Any questions for Travis on that process? 
All right, we will move to our standing committee and regional council reports. First up is Tepe. Is Rebecca on the line, Shelley? She's absent, but I have the draft minutes here I can read from. All right, thank you. Uh, the last Tepe meeting, the uh, body approved their month, their minutes from November. They accepted uh, an approved Carrie Lewis as a vice chair for that body. Uh, they, the motion was approved to uh, remove the list of discretionary reports. Um, the Chief Garcia discussed the emergency declaration sunsetting. And Boss Brink went over the dashboard data. Um, and then Dr. Bradley gave background on the trauma annual report and members discussed looking at changes uh, for having the data viewed as rural versus metro data. And that's the main action at that meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, next for Education Standing Committee, Brian. Good morning. Education Committee met on March 17th. Some of the topics for our agenda was to approve and look at a maternal resuscitation and intervention uh, training to be posted on the web. Uh, education website BMS and that training was approved. Also brought forward by PACES was a naloxone for pediatric patients uh, training and that was also approved. I believe both of those are now on the website. We uh, approved the formation of a work group to review and or create training curriculums for a supplemental training required skills. That work group was approved. There was discussion of the impacts of the National Registry of EMT's ALS redesign and distributive education limits. There may be may need to be legislative updates to uh, com be, come into compliance with our national registry. Um, where was discussion concerning the uh, ending of the emergency declaration by the governor. And then uh, there was discussion on the results of the state and regional training and workforce survey that was presented by Travis Connors. Our next meeting will be on July 21st at 10.30 a.m. Thank you, Brian. If you'd like to continue for PMD update. Yes, PMD also met on March 17th. There was discussion on the EMCT scope of practice. Uh, was brought up that there is a moratorium on rulemaking and the scope of practice being in exempt rule does qualify under the moratorium at this time, and the Bureau continues to keep an eye on that. There was discussion of hospital-based paramedic practice and uh, looking at the future on how to possibly look at a scope of practice in that setting. There was discussion on the EMS Hospital Collaborative Patient Offload Program. Chief Garcia and Dr. Bradley displayed some of the collaborative work group ideas that came out of the Southern Arizona and Central Arizona to address this issue. There was discussion and approval to form a work group to look at the triage treatment and transport guideline document. And our next meeting will be on July 21st at 12 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next for Regional EMS Council, uh, first up for Ames, Roy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bradley. A uh, very comprehensive update was provided uh, in the, uh, I believe it was the uh, 17th of this month update uh, that Shelley sent out. I won't uh, take your time to go through all that. Pretty sure everybody here can read. I will just want to emphasize that we've got a very exciting uh, EMS Odyssey coming up. It's our 22nd annual EMS Odyssey. It is a virtual conference this year. Hopefully next year we can do an 
in-person conference and we've been budgeting and, and planning to do that. But this year we're keeping it a Zoom conference and uh, it's very reasonably priced for both members and non-members of Ames. And we encourage anyone that's interested to uh, sign up and uh, get on board. And uh, uh, it has seven CEs available and it's co-sponsored by Ames and the Indiana Emergency Nurses Association. Uh, and that's all I have. All right, thank you, Roy. Uh, next up, Sarah, I know, she, I don't see her on the meeting, but I know she did provide a written summary. It's yeah, Gail, this, this is Dan. Uh, uh, yes, there is an extensive written summary and she's at a ribbon cutting for Northwest Fire for their new uh, administration building today so she's not able to be on it's, it uh, is right on top of it so we so we split we split up and she's at northwest and and uh, i'm i'm in the state meetings uh, nothing right. nothing big shaking all, all is well in the in the southern region thank you dan uh next up vince for names good morning uh the report estimated if you'd like to read the details of our may meeting uh, the biggest thing that we're working on right now is finalizing the names provider grants. So our agencies should be getting those checks shortly. And names is planning to start meeting in person for the August 12th meeting if COVID levels permit. And we'll be meeting at the Sedona Fire Station. Thank you for hosting Sedona Fire. Also a shout out to Verde Valley Ambulance. They are celebrating their 50th anniversary today. And Guardian Medical Transport and Guardian Air are hosting an EMS week lunch celebration tomorrow at Station 52 in Flagstaff. You can go to our Facebook page if you're in the area and would like to stop by. All are invited. And if you are happening to be transporting a patient to Flagstaff Medical Center, stop by the paramedic room. We have some high level snacks and some cold drinks for you. Happy EMS week. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. And next, Rod for Wackham's. Hi, Dr. Bradley. Uh, we had our uh, our annual meeting uh, May 12th earlier this month. Uh, uh, we did uh, have elections for president and secretary. We we retained our our secretary Heather Miller from Kingman Regional, but uh, for the first time since 1991, we're not going to have Mike Caswell on a board uh, of any kind. So. Uh, we have a new new president uh, for Wackhams. It is uh, Forrest Taylor. He is a uh, chief at uh, one of the uh, deputy chiefs at Bullhead Fire. Um, the hybrid meetings are are, are what we have uh, defaulted to, and uh, they they seem to work really perfectly. And uh, that's it's it's really a good thing that came out of the the crazy. Uh, world of, of COVID, but uh, we're, all of our meetings are, are held in that, uh, in that uh, format now. Our next uh, general meeting is July 14th in beautiful downtown Pine Lake, Arizona. And uh, that's all I have. All right, thank you so much. Uh, next for paces, I am not sure if Dr. Woolridge is on the phone. Uh, if he is, and I can speak in his stead, Dr. Bradley. That would be great, Adam. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so if he isn't, uh, we last met on uh, March 17th. Uh, we have no vacancies in our council seats right now. Uh, as Brian mentioned, uh, we did uh, complete that pediatric naloxone training, which is now live on our education and independent study website. Uh, so that's a great tool that we're happy to have pushed out. Um, we are currently fielding two work groups, uh, our pediatric behavioral health work group, as well as our uh, training gap uh, work groups. So the behavioral health is, is uh, the ask is for volunteers. If you're volunteered or, or if you happen to have extensive knowledge of behavioral health or uh, knowing that it does work, we are looking, uh, we're in our sort of incipient phases of it and we're looking for uh, to bring together people who have a great deal of knowledge about behavioral health systems in their area. Uh, and our next MACES meeting is on July uh, 21st. And that's all I got. Thanks, Dr. Bradley. Thank you, Adam. Uh, next for discussion and action items, uh, if the group doesn't mind, I'm going to just move item E up to the top. Uh, Travis has to be in another meeting, so I wanted to make sure he has enough time to present uh, his section. 
Uh, Travis, if you'd like to discuss the regional EMS education and workforce assessment. Sure, thank you, Dr. Bradley. Shelly, is it okay if I share my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, let me know when everyone can uh, see my screen here. Can everyone see my screen? We sure we can. can. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, let's get into the regional EMS education and workforce assessment. Um, we sent out a survey a little while ago. And so the methodology behind it was to gather information on the EMS workforce needs and interests in Arizona. We had 94 EMS agencies who responded to the survey, 164 EMCTs who responded to the survey. We do have some limitations, obviously, with this was the sample size, the method of distribution, uneven regional rep representation, potential for overlap as well. So all the surveys were anonymous, and the results of this assessment will be shared at the state and regional level only. And so respondents were asked to identify whether they were responding on behalf of their EMS agency or as themselves. And the department does not have any additional funding identified for EMS workforce initiatives yet. But we are hopeful that the surveys like this will allow us to better understand the needs of the regions and the event we are able to identify funding for education and training in the future. So here's a summary of the responses. As you can see, we have EMS agencies on the left and EMCTs on the right side here. So the average number uh, or average years of someone who responded of the EMCs who responded was 14 years in the field, which is which is great. So some main barriers we have identified here is that first of all, 63 of 94 agencies at this time were experiencing staffing shortages, and I'm sure that hasn't let up yet. So some of the main barriers identified were lack of compensation or incentives, lack of recruitment resources increase in EMS provider illness and or injury, lack of resources related to resilience, mental health, and or wellness, and a lack of training opportunities. So this is data as reported by EMS agencies. As you can see on the left-hand side, we have a little short text there in a smaller font. So here's some new or ongoing staff shortages at the time of the survey, ongoing 44%, Ongoing works with COVID, 8%, new, 19%, new with COVID-21, recruitment challenges, 3%, and NA, 4%. And we asked the question of approximately how many EMCTs does your agency need? And as you can see here, the main distribution of this data is in that 6 to 10 range, um, also followed by the 11 to 20. And so obviously that's, that's alarming that's a lot of individuals that are needed by the agency and as i said previously i'm sure this has not let up so some of the recruitment and retention barriers and again this is agency level data and it was select all that apply was pay the geography and location stress of the position time commitment no interest at all training requirements and other And so how agencies are addressing staffing issues, suggestions, and best practices, we can see here that actively recruiting, you know, bonuses, overtime, management, covering shifts, no money for raises, increased pay. And I'll, I'll pause here just to allow everyone to kind of take in the information. And this was one to where people could select all that apply and also input information into a field. Okay, and moving on. So as you can see here, we have the education piece and we can see that six, 7% of agencies that have a dedicated EMS training officer. We can see that agencies are offering continuing ed courses to their, to their EMPTs, 86% and 77% agencies that provide support to their staff. 
for education credit. So this is data from EMCT responses. And remember, there's only 164. So when the one of the locations obviously was a sample size. And so we asked, how important is it for you to go outside of your department to get continuing education? And it appeared that very important was, you know, had, had the most percentage of, of the data distribution there, followed by, you know, important and then neutral and going down that ladder. So the primary method of training by EMS agencies, we can see here that virtual, and again, at the time of the survey, virtual is 46%, in-person was 38%, and other was 16%. And maybe those numbers have, have normalized a little more now, or maybe it's continuing the trend of virtual being you know, the, the primary method. So the preferred method of learning by top three EMS agencies was lectures and classes, case reviews, online internet learning. Top three by EMCTs was lecture and classes, case reviews, and high realistic simulation. So this is data from EMS agencies and EMCTs. And we asked additional training area suggestions. And what you'll see in, in red, the highlighted responses are suggestions by EMS agencies and EMCTs that, that came pretty often, that were pretty prevalent in their responses back to us. And so I'll pause here to let everyone kind of absorb the information. Okay, moving on. So ENCTs here were asked all, I were asked to check all that apply to this, to this question. And it's for additional training area suggestions. And as you can see here, cardiac number one, EKG, and then going down, we can see that the data goes, goes down. And I'll pause here for everyone to, to absorb the information and, and ask any questions. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So this question was related to the challenges related to continuing ed and our training. And the top three, according to EMS agencies, were barriers to continuing ed, you know, the opportunities such as cost, location, et cetera, inability to provide community education such as CPR, AAD training due to workforce shortages, lack of available continuing ed opportunities for existing workforce. The top three by EMCTs was the time commitment, the cost, and the distance and travel. So here we can see that according to EMCTs, which of the following make a CE program worthy of your time? And the bolded responses are the top four responses, which are the first four that you'll see there. And so I will pause here to let everyone soak in the information. Okay, and some, some common things we saw throughout the survey responses from both ENCTs and agencies. Here was decreasing interest in public safety, you know, in EMS as a career field. The EMS workforce leaving the field and feeling burnt out. The challenges to recruiting and re retaining those individuals in rural areas due to commute, travel, the vaccination requirements, retirement eligibility, and so on there. So I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions around the data and around the presentation. And um, here's Julia's contact information. She, she sent out the survey. She helped put that to the presentation. And she will be on leave here pretty shortly. 
And so I'll also provide my email in the chat as well. If you were to email her and ask her, you know, I'm sure she'll have a message referring you to me, but I will go ahead and put my email in the chat here as well for any follow-up questions that you may have. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Travis. And if we can maybe get a copy of this uh, to share with the group in case anyone is interested. That'd be absolutely. great. I, yeah, absolutely. If you can send me an email after this uh, meeting, that'd be fantastic. I'll also share it in the chat as well. Okay. Yes, yeah, so if you could share that in the chat, that way anyone uh, who wants a copy of it can see that as well. And thank you uh, for presenting that today, Travis. So quite a bit of work went into uh, developing that presentation and uh, we appreciate everyone's involvement with that survey. All right, we will go back to discussion action items. If I can get a motion and a second to discuss, amend, and approve uh, the EMS meeting minutes from January 20th, 2022. So move, right. We're all second. Thank you. All right, uh, those were in your packet and I'll just have Shelly keep scrolling quickly. All right. Are there any recommended amendments? Hearing none, anyone opposed to approving the meeting minutes as projected, please say nay. Any abstentions? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Uh, next for discussion items, we wanted to just briefly discuss the EMS patient offload plans. Uh, this is something that we've really been trying to uh, circulate as kind of a best practice. Uh, Southern Arizona had initially developed uh, their offload plan to help address some of the offload uh, times that were, they were having issues with in the Southern region. Uh, the Central region also met uh, and really worked on developing a pretty similar plan. Uh, that one went live uh, a few weeks ago and is uh, in the process right now. So we just wanted to continue to highlight some of that work. I'm not sure if there's any other processes in other parts of the state, but uh, as we see different things come up and we hear them at different regional councils, we really wanna make sure that we share those best practices that can help improve the EMS system. Uh, Rachel, I didn't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that. Um, thank you, Gail. I think it's just important that we make sure we're sharing the resources and things that have been developed, um, plans that can be used as tools as the system, you know, has to flex beyond capacity at times. And so any resources we can provide through these committees, I think is very helpful to highlight. Thank you. Any comments uh, from anyone on the meeting? All right, hearing none, we will go to item C. Uh, Shelly, if you can open that link, please. And thank you, you got my next question request, which was to make it bigger. <laughs> All right, so uh, we just wanted to remind everyone that uh, as we are looking at EMS week, uh, and as Jim spoke regarding uh, EMS resiliency and wellness, uh, we do want to make sure that we update our website. Uh, the Bureau has had a resiliency section of our website for quite some time uh, and really wanted to kind of highlight some of the things that are on there, but also ensure that if there are other items that we do not have included, that we include that on our website as well. Uh, we recognize there are many resources throughout the state uh, and do want to put those out there. Uh, if you can scroll down a little bit. Anything else that uh, anyone else from the Bureau would like to add to this? Dr. Bradley, this is Rachel. 
Uh, I think that as we look at our website and we refresh the resources that are on the Bureau's EMS Resiliency website, um, we do want to make sure that, you know, any additional resources, much like Jim highlighted today, right, that we can, um, that we can bring to the website. We want to make sure that we're keeping that list refreshed. Um, you will see we have highlighted the crisis hotlines and suicide prevention lifeline resources on this particular handout. There also is a reference to the 988 national hotline that we understand is launching July 16th of this year. So we are, you know, putting that information out there and any feedback that this group has on resources, please let us know. Thank you, Rachel. All right, we can move uh, to the next item. Uh, so this is gonna be more informational since uh, staff elected to table their motion on the ACS field triage. Uh, if you could potentially open uh, attachment D1 just for the group to review. So to give a little bit of background on this to this committee, um, the American College of Surgeons updated the field triage of injured patients, which is essentially the trauma triage algorithm for EMS. Uh, this was just published uh, at the beginning of 2022. Uh, this was after a lot of work which was done by that organization. Uh, the last update, just to give everyone a little bit of context, was done in 2011. And at that time, STAB did endorse uh, as written the ACS field triage as sponsored by the CDC and ACS. As part of that endorsement from STAB, uh, there was quite a bit of education that went around, in, including some pocket guides that were given to EMS providers and agencies and hospitals to really try to uh, create a more standardized uh, system for triage of patients in the pre-hospital setting with traumatic injury. Uh, EM, uh, STAB did discuss this quite a bit in the agenda. You will see there are a number of items attached in item D. Uh, these include some educational PowerPoints. They're very well done slide decks on how to educate on this. Uh, if you can potentially scroll down to the yellow section, Shelley, uh, the part that STAB wants to have some more discussion on is really in regards to the uh, head injury, fall injury, and anticoagulant use. I think that was really the component that had the most discussion with concerns about how to potentially move forward with that. Uh, the feeling from staff was that they would like to hold another meeting to discuss this uh, due to the meeting cycles and the fact that we would like to update the uh, state TTTGs by the end of this calendar year. Uh, we are going to uh, convene uh, staff for a special meeting sometime in the next couple months to discuss that further. So as that moves forward, Shelley will make sure that that gets uh, widely circulated. We will send out the gov delivery communication. Uh, so that everyone who wants to participate in that meeting can participate. Uh, but really that was the big piece that I think there needs to be more discussion on and the reason why that group wanted to uh, convene for a separate meeting. Any questions or comments regarding that? All right. Uh, next, uh, letter F, discuss critical care and community pathway certification. Uh, Rachel, did you want to handle that piece? Yes, thank you, Dr. Bradley. I'm actually teeing up a couple discussion slides for us right now for this particular topic. Thank you, Shelly. Um, a little bit of background. Oops. We'll get it popped up right here. I don't see it. <laughs> All right, looking good. Go to the next slide. Okay, so a little bit of background. I know that the slides are a maybe a little bit small with the text that we have up here, but we wanted to make sure that um, as we go through the rulemaking process for ground ambulance rules, that we are getting feedback 
particularly on critical care services. That definition has come up through the ground ambulance rulemaking process. So one of the things that you'll see here on the slide is that we are seeking feedback on the critical care services definition that is currently in our Article 9 CON draft rules. I'm going to read out the definition since I think not everybody in the room can see the slides we're looking at today. In the draft rules, we have defined critical care services as um, services provided during an interfacility transport to a patient who has an illness or injury acutely or chronic, chronically impairing one or more organ systems, such as such that the conditions are life-threatening and require constant monitoring to avoid deterioration of the patient's condition. We're also, through that rulemaking, contemplating staffing for critical care services. And so for this council in particular, if there's any feedback that the committee members have to offer on the critical care services definition or staffing requirements for such transport, we wanted to open up that dialogue today we're also reviewing not just critical care as part of this rulemaking that we're doing. Overall, as we're talking and looking at other states' models, we know that other states are also closely contemplating critical care as well as community paramedicine. And we have some information on the next slide we're going to share where we've seen other states that are now addressing both critical care and paramedicine, community paramedicine, um, in terms of certification, training, and scope of practice. So the next slide that we'll share, um, it is critical, it highlights critical care policies by state. We can certainly distribute this link if it's helpful and the council members would like to look at it. The website, if you click on it, goes through all of our states. Um, shares their website and identifies the states that have looked at critical care um, as a license, as a certification, and as an endorsement, and quite a few that have expanded scope of practice for critical care paramedics. It's some interesting information, and so we can definitely get that into the chat if anyone wants to peek at that website with that overview by state. If we go to the next slide, Shelly, there's just a few discussion questions that we'll tee up here as time allows. The first is, as you said, any input that you have on the critical care services definition, we'd love to hear it. We'd also like to hear if committee members have any input on potential staffing requirements for critical care interfacility transport. And then finally, based on the fact that we know other states are looking at critical care and community paramedicine certification, training, and scope of practice, does this council have any feedback on how Arizona may begin to approach these topics and any considerations, again, for certification, training, or potential scope of practice as this field moves forward. I will pause there. Um, Dr. Bradley, I don't know if you have any feedback on these topics to kick this off, and I'm not sure if Ruth Ann, our rule writer, has joined or not. So I can just briefly add that on the uh, Nesemso medical directors listserv, there are a number of other states that are also in the process of developing a critical care pathway. So uh, the list that is there is rather small of number of states that currently have it, but there are several other states that are actively in the process of developing a critical care pathway as well. Um, this is uh, Franco. Um, uh, this looks like great work and the questions and concepts, the framework looks solid. Um, I would recommend, however, at that bottom bullet point as the as the Bureau is looking at certification, training, scope of practice, I see a lot of emphasis being put on on the, you know, the the the, the creation, certification recognition training of the provider. But what I don't see the Bureau asking is questions related to the oversight of such providers and putting in minimum expectations for this in, for the industry on the ongoing uh, oversight, which at the with which at the agency level involves, you know, agency level credentialing of this provider, ongoing CE, 
uh, quality management and all of the work that is done by by you know managerial and um, uh, physician level personnel at the agency level so that these providers uh, you know stay uh, uh, solid and fruitful across their across the span of their career. I see a lot on the front end, but not much on the ongoing uh, management side and oversight side. Hi, it's Brian. Go ahead, Brian. Um, so it, it seems to me that if we were to look at certifications, and let's just take the critical care paramedic for right now, because that seems to be the big topic, particularly related to the uh, rule make, Article 9 rulemaking that's going on and, and using these definitions. It seems like the concept of, of having a certification would require statutory changes, rather, at least to me, rather than uh, simply being a regulatory issue. That the, the we have pretty well defined what those levels are in in legislation, and it, so I think it would it would require those to be incorporated into the statutes to provide for a certification pathway. Um, I've had I've had some other discussions on critical care paramedics about adding a, a separate line to. The Arizona scope of practice model with X's. Some of those have some consideration mm -hmm. that that doesn't provide uh, a definition of how the training is obtained. So I still think it might be appropriate that those be added on as a scope of practice critical care paramedic endorsement, and then in in the exempt rulemaking specifically identify what kind of training might or might not be required, what kind of oversight might or might not be required, and then refer it to that particular line in the scope of practice model. It seems like that would ease up the amount of time that it might take to get this done. It seems like there's a reasonable possibility to ask for an exemption to proceed with the scope of practice model rule since it's going to be related to these other rules that are coming out. So that seems like maybe an answer we could look at rather than going through the, the certification process. Thank you, Brian. I see uh... Roy, you have your hand up. Yes, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, yes, I uh, absolutely agree with Brian that uh, a legislative uh, change for EMCTs would be time consuming and potentially problematic. Uh, I, I just hearken back and, and because I'm old, uh, think about how we instituted uh, the process to, uh, I guess you would call it an endorsement for Cox Medics. They had an expanded scope of practice, expanded uh, uh, armamentarium that they could use. So perhaps we should look back at that model. But I agree with Brian in terms of this, rather than fundamentally going to the uh, legislative definition of an EMCT, that we look at it as an endorsement that requires special skills, special training, and special oversight. Thank you, Roy. I see there is a comment, uh, Matt, and I don't know if you're able to. Hi, Dr. Bradley. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying uh, it seems like the there's already exists national critical care certifications uh, that are already overseen by national agencies. The IBSC is an example who uh oversees the rigorous testing process and the continuing education requirements and so it would seem that the state could easily move to just adopt those pre-approved certifications and then would only need to actually define the scope that would be allowed to be practiced within the state of arizona so not necessarily starting from scratch but just picking up that that last bit so that's just my thought thank you i'm not sure if ruthann is on the line if not uh definitely i think these are the components that uh, she guides more than the Bureau. So 
uh, that that's excellent feedback. We'll make sure that that is uh, passed along to her as well. Any further discussion or comments on any of these components? All right, next on the agenda, uh, TJ McKay to discuss training program and, and our EMT updates. Good morning, can everyone hear me okay? We sure can, thank you. Okay, uh, I'll try and make this quick. A, uh, I'll start with the second topic since there hasn't been any real change at all. The um, limits on distributive education have not changed and are not scheduled to change until after the National Registry meeting next month. So there's no substantive changes there. For the ALS sunsetting, the redesign uh, program, they had four meetings in 2021. So far in 2022, have had four meetings for a total of eight, and they've been uh, increasing in sophistication and depth during the uh, current year. January started off with um, some discussion on the retest requirements going from a 15-day wait period to a seven-day wait period. Uh, February, they started on some clinical judgment concepts that they introduced. I'm going to put in a link to the... Um, uh, DOI for the concept that they've been using that was presented to the um, governing body for National Registry. If anyone wants to read that, they can do it at their own time. Uh, that was presented to the board at their February meeting, and the link is there that you can read at your leisure. Uh, in March, they started discussing some of the performance examination templates, uh, the feedback how they would deliver those, the rubrics that they're going to use, and started working with some of the um, educational um, resource providers so that they could start to develop some uh, textbook and different uh, support items for the program. And then in April, started discussing some of the technology enhanced items that they're gonna start using with the expanded test and uh, they went with the technology enhanced items they're using TEIs as the abbreviation for that and started discussing those the four main types that they're going to be using is some of the drag and drop checkbox build list and sequence items I'm going to put in a link to the chat that has some examples of those items that they are considering with the increased um, assessments that they're gonna be doing with the computer-based assessments. You should see that link as well. Um, and again, each, each month they've been adding to the concept of how they are going to do this. The plans for implementation haven't changed much. They're still looking at late 2022 for some introduction of the new testing concepts with full implementation not to take place until mid or late 2023. And they continue to promise to work with vendors and uh, education providers to make sure that they're ready to go before those requirements are implemented. Um, we have, again, uh, I believe someone referenced it earlier, some statutory requirements for uh, comprehensive psychomotor exams within the state. So we still have, even though they've sunsetted a lot of the items at the BLS level, we still have a state requirement for those to take place. They're not gonna do any substantial renovations to those until next year. And uh, we still have a requirement at the ALS level as well for a comprehensive physical exam. So um, we have those protections in place where the state can move forward uh, with its own recommendations, despite the actions that National Registry is taking place um, with their sunsetting and redesign of their psychomotor testing. Uh, hopefully that answers any current questions. If anybody has anything else for me, please feel free to ask or shoot me an email and I'll do my best to get you information you need. Thank you, TJ. Any questions from anyone else on the line? 
All right. And next is agenda items to be considered for the next meeting. If you have any items you would like added to the agenda, please forward them to either myself or Shelly. Next on the agenda is call to the public. Next is a summary of uh, events. Uh, you'll see a number of upcoming events there uh, in the month of June. Our next meeting is scheduled for September 15th, 2022 at 1030 AM. If I can get a motion to adjourn, please. So move, Brian. Thank you, Brian. All right. Second. I think I heard a second there. Second from Roy. Thanks, Roy. All right, meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.